so much spectacular ways for you to grow in the grace that you have for your life. You know, the special thing about it, that everybody has a personalized grace. And the grace is not uh, a corporate thing. It's a personalized thing. It's, it's, it's dependent on how well you humble yourself, which means how well the Father can um, overtake you. How much you give your will over to the Father overtaking you. And so over the course of everyone's life, if you want to grow in light, it's predicated on how much the Father can overtake you, how much can the Father possess you and make you his, 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 his pleasure. So when you look at the life of Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, there was people that had grace before her. But when the grace came on her, she excelled everybody else's grace level because of her personalized humility. So where they was, where they was casualizing King Jesus, uh, <laughs> where they was casualizing King Jesus, Y'all didn't see my chest, right? <laughs> Where they was casualizing King Jesus. She was taking him serious. Where they was um, drifting, she was locking in. Where they was lukewarm, she was on fire and refiring. Where they was ignoring, she was listening. Where uh, they were um, leaving their first works, she was holding on to her first works and learning the depths of those first works. So... The grace of Mary Magdalene came after the grace of Peter. So why is King Jesus giving her grace to go tell Peter a message? I want to show you something else. Apostle Paul's grace came after John. So why is... Apostle Paul is saying that he's the chief amongst apostles, or he, he, he's, he's the highest by the grace of God. So let me ask you a question. Their grace was settled on them before the grace was even settled. While the grace was settled on them, Apostle Paul was persecuting the church, murdering, walking in hatred, walking in strife, walking in persecution. So how is it that he's now saying my grace is higher than all of them? That means that he lived by the concept he was forgiven much and he chose to love much. You rob God if you have trespassed against him a lot. But he can't pull on you a lot. So Apostle Paul was Jesus's enemy. But now Apostle Paul is pitting extra work. In being Jesus's friend. And he tells you the secret. I'm doing it by grace. So the grace of God, it doesn't make you sin more justify sin or want to sin the grace of God is actually a supernatural power that goes to your belly and appetite your mind your will and emotions and it causes there to be an eruption a volcano of godliness 
which mean is the overtaking of God's personality on a person. So whenever somebody starts walking in the grace of God, apostolically, they are now growing in the personality of God. So when you are around someone that's lustful, God's personality doesn't want to lust with them. So you won't lust with them. When you're around somebody that's full of strife, God's personality don't want to get into no drama, no argument, no, no, no drama, no friction with people. So the personality of God will overtake you. So the grace of God is really God transferring his personality to you firstly. Because before we deal with the grace financially and the grace in the area of provision, the major thing that God is after is his image and likeness coming out of your conduct, your thoughts, your meditation. What is the difference between a thought and a meditation? What's the difference? A thought can come and go. A meditation, it lives with you. Okay, let me show you something. Let me give you an example. When Peter saw Moses and Elijah, the thought came, let's build a tabernacle. But when Jesus is at the cross, Jesus, uh, Peter not thinking about building the tabernacle. Wow. I want to show you something. Samuel is thinking about the word of the Lord to speak to Eli when he's a little boy. But when he's a grown man and he's talking to Saul, he's not thinking about the prophecy to Eli. If he was still thinking about it, it's a meditation. So when he's talking to Saul, he's not thinking about Eli the way that he was when he was a boy. He meditated on what he was dealing with with Eli, because remember, he didn't want to tell Eli, and Eli told him, tell me what the Lord has told you. I know the Lord said something to you. That show you how Eli was so prophetic. If you listen to me, man, it's like, it's, it's like levels and dimensions of uh, uh, understanding that you could take on. Like, I'm talking to you about grace, but I give you grace every time I teach. This is my job. My job is to give you divine personality. That's my job. And because he is the word made flesh and dwell among you, because he is the word, the living word, he transfers grace by his word. So you got to hear words that he's speaking to get the personality into reaping. Another thing that I want you to catch is that when you sow money seeds into the Holy Ghost, into the word of God being preached to you, you ooze that grace and that power that's in the word into manifesting in your finances, your body, your mind, your emotions, and your life path. You suck honey from the rock through sowing seed. When, when we talk about honey from the rock, the rock is Christ. The honey is the sweet realm of the Father, is the sweet realm of the Lord, where you experience good things, heavenly blessings, prosperity, pleasures. Remember, the Bible talks about at his right hand of pleasures forevermore. Well, that's what honey from the rock is about. Honey from the rock is about experiencing the good life that God imparts to you while you have chosen to receive his image, his personality. That's what the likeness of God is. He made Adam in his image and likeness. And the likeness means that he's just like God in his response. So the reason why you don't see Adam ever being tempted 
by that tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he was fully dedicated to the likeness. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. The likeness didn't care about that tree of the knowledge of good and evil entering into Adam's body. So the likeness of God in Adam, the personality of God in Adam, that wasn't his focus. So Adam wasn't focused on it. So if you understand a woman comes into the earth realm and what Satan does is Satan is targeting the likeness. And from that day to this day, women are still struggling with the likeness of God. Because the serpent is their go-to before the image of God and the likeness of God is even um, brewing upon them. Before the Lord could even start construction upon them. Let me ask you a question. What was going on with Miriam to make her gossip about Moses? Moses had already blessed Miriam. Moses was taking care of Miriam. Miriam had it good and easy. So why did she have animosity and then number two, Miriam couldn't marry Moses. So why was she so angry at who Moses married? It's because the likeness of God cannot live and settle upon Miriam. So even though Miriam has favor, even though Miriam has blessing, even though Miriam has access to the goodness of God, Miriam has not accepted God's personality towards Moses. And because she hasn't accepted the personality of God towards Moses, Satan's personality manifests towards Moses, which is to cause strife, issues, problems in Moses' life. So here's the powerful thing about the grace of God when you receive it, for the image and likeness of God, his personality. You receive it in all things towards all people. So let me show you something. Say, um, say Marco receives the image of God and likeness of God for his manager, his co-workers. He's going to act the way that God wants to act towards them. So, so if they start talking about ESPN and talking about sports, the co-workers say, you know, ESPN. If God doesn't want that conversation, God is not going to move through Marco to engage the conversation. Now, if Marco is not in the image and likeness of God, he could engage the conversation about ESPN, the sports center and, and, and sports talk. But if the image of God and the likeness of God has taken root in Marco, the Lord can overtake Marco. Remember I said at the beginning of the broadcast, the Father want to overtake you. That's how your grace increases. There's, there, 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 are, uh, uh, there are a group of uh, uh, billions of people that resist God overtaking them. So the Lord can't tell them, even though you plan to go to Thanksgiving here, I don't want you to go. They still going to buy their ticket and they still going to catch that flight and they still going to be on that plane. And on Thanksgiving, they're going to be right there in the presence of where God said, don't go. When the father cannot overtake people it's because he will present to you his wishes He'll tell you, I don't want you to wear green. And, but you'll look at your closet and say, I got all these green shirts. My favorite shoes is green. All these things are green. And you'll never evaluate how is it that I have grown to like something that God is now telling me he doesn't like. The mind of evil never even captures that. What the mind of evil does is say, I'm going to wear this green because I got mostly green. And in two days, you'll be wearing a green outfit. In two weeks, you'll even forget that God had told you not to wear green. Because you're not a person that the father can overtake. 
So oftentimes in life, people blame other people for why they don't become great. You know, this door don't open for me because this person done pit a bad reputation on me. And, you know, it does and does. You forget. There are people right now that talk about their jail record, why they can't get certain jobs. Nobody will hire me come out jail record. Well, what do you say to Joseph? Joseph was in jail for rape. Joseph's record said that he raped a rich man's wife in his own house behind his back. My goodness, my goodness. Talk to me in here. Talk to me in here. It's 1002 on my end. It's 1002 on my end. It's 1002 on my end. <laughs> Why this revelation going forth? There's timing, there's timing, there's timing, there's timing. His record said that he entered into a place as a slave and violated his master's wife and served a sentence because he raped her and she snitched on him and let her husband know, I was raped by your slave. So how do we see Joseph as governor over the land? How do we see Joseph as the chief, the captain, narrating how money and provision gets to the people in the land during the famine? How is it he the richest holder of finances in the land? Because Joseph received the image and the likeness of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when you receive the image and likeness of God, it is God that lifts you up and gives you the power to get wealth and prospers you and favors you and congratulates you and uplifts you and exalts you. It is the Lord that's doing it. That's why the Bible tells you to love your enemies. Why are you going to hate your enemies for? For you to hate your enemies, that means that you'll operate in uh, energy and, and mind power. You'll use your brain to calculate how you could manifest your dislike towards them. Why would you do that when they cannot stop what the father is going to increase on you, manifest for you, and place benefit in your hands for you to enjoy? So when you understand the concept of how the Lord's plan is not hindered by enemies, it doesn't stop by enemies. It actually accelerates. I want you to think about this. God switches gears when you have an enemy. He deals with you differently. Let me tell you something. If somebody belongs to me and, and, and I am assigned to them, I'm going to fight for them. I'm going to fight for them. You know why? Because I'm assigned for them, to them. So I'm going to fight for them. I'm not going to let them... Uh, I'm not going to let them just lose or, or be harmed without me uh, interceding or, or, or intervening. I, 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 I want to place this concept to you. I want to show you something. When the father sees an enemy rise up against you, the father actually switches gears towards you. Not even just the enemy towards you. The father started looking at you all oh, like, oh, oh, no, you, no, you don't. You don't understand what Satan was telling the Lord. Satan told the Lord, you know that you put a hedge around Job. I can't even touch him. Wait, 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 wait. Job didn't put a hedge around himself. The Lord put a hedge around Job. 
So what does this tell you? The Lord was overly protective of Job. Now, how did they get here in their relationship? Job is building an altar before God. He is sowing. He's honoring God. He's listening to the Lord's instruction. He's constantly following God's ways, right? He's constantly doing the things that make the father feel appreciated. So the father said, no, 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 I'm going to protect you. I'm going to make sure that you're good. I'm going to make sure that all is well with you all the time. And I'm going to make sure that when an enemy rise up against you, they're going to have to deal with me first. And, and, and if they think that they're fighting you, but I'm going to pop up. I'm in the bushes. <laughs> I'm in the bushes with mines. No, <laughs> no, nah, nah, let them come through. Let them come through. No, 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 no. Let them come through and think nobody here. Yeah. I'm in the bushes with mine. And when they think they're about to ambush you, I'm going to ambush them. Because I'm behind you. I'm your husband. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Look at what Job chapter 1 verse 1 says. There was a man in the land of Uz. Whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. And one that feared God and eschewed evil. Wow. Wow. It says that he was one that feared God. He was perfect and upright. My goodness. Now watch this here. It said that it was born unto him sons, seven sons and three daughters. Look at verse three. His substance also was 7,000 sheep. 7,000 sheep. There was people that didn't have two sheep. He got 7,000. No, no, no. So if they got two sheep, let's count 998 sheep. They'll only have 1,000. Okay, let's go to 1,000 more sheep. They'll only have 2,000. Okay, let's go to another 1,000 sheep. They'll only have 3,000. He had 7,000 sheep. No, no. I want you to really brainstorm this. Imagine having seven sheep. At your apartment right now. Could they fit inside your apartment? Where you going to put them? Some in the bathroom, right? <laughs> no, let's go a little further. Imagine putting seven sheep in your hotel room. Where you going to put them? Hmm? I'm talking about seven. I ain't said 7,000, baby. I said seven. I said seven with an M. <laughs> oh my gosh now think about pitting seven sheep inside of your car could they fit no no they can't fit inside your car of course not could one sheep fit inside your car no possibly not no. alright this man has seven thousand sheep so where he gonna pit them they operate on land i want you to catch this narrative so if sheep operate only on land they don't operate in a in a closed in house in a closed in place they are on land so this man had enough acres of land to house seven thousand sheep okay that's seven thousand sheep now let me tell you something a backyard cannot fit seven thousand sheep even if you pit them on top of each other. So, so Job has a large land anointing, extensive land anointing. So now you understand that when you sow in seed, God deals with land 
and he wants to give you largeness and he wants to enlarge your territory, enlarge your environment. He wants to give you a bigger place in your living arrangements. So this is on the mind of God when you sow and seed. Because if you look at the life of Job, he has an extensive, ridiculous amount of acres. Not no two acres, three acres. This man got 7,000 sheep. Where are you going to pit them? Not 5,000, y'all. Not 2,000, y'all. Not 3,000. Not 6,000. Not 6,500. Not 6,099. He got 7,000. Now, number two. Where he going to find food to feed this 7,000? Mm, mm, mm. Now, this is another subject. Where he going to find food? So now you're talking about him feeding the 7,000 sheep, making sure they got water. So where, where has he opened up a well where water could flow so that they're always be hydrated, where they have food to eat? Saints, this is so mighty. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for revelation. Thank you for impartation right now. Thank you for transfers going on. I'm giving you an apostolic transfer as you're listening to me. I'm, I'm giving your brain cells an infusion, an intrusion of new oil. I'm giving you a prosperity anointing as a prophet of God. Look what it says right here, 7,000 sheep, uh-oh, and 3,000 camels. Wait a minute, we just dealt with the, uh, the influx, the surplus of 7,000 sheep. How are we going into 3,000 camels now? Wait, this is a ridiculous amount now. Now, look at this, no. What go on with him, man? Look at this, no. Look at the thing right here, the thing. This, this whippersnapper, no, has 7,000 sheep, 3, 3, 3,000 camels, 3, 5, 5. <laughs> if you want a lawyer, get a Jamaican because they're passionate about everything. No, no, he would not kill him, no. He love him, he love him. Look at the picture. I got picture of childhood picture. They wearing boxes. They wearing boxes at three, at three years old. <laughs> he done showed the picture with your macaroni legs. <laughs> Y'all wearing, hey, Arnold boxers. Hey, Arnold boxers with macaroni legs. Because <laughs> you're a Jamaican lawyer. At three, no, at three, three years old. Three years old, down to five. Look at the Hey Arnold boxers. At three. Your Honor, they had three boxes all together. And look, Your Honor, if you count him, me, and you, we are three. These are our signs that my client... You want to get out of jail, get your Jamaican lawyer because they're going to be passionate. Look at this here. This is powerful. Are you understanding this? We got 7,000 sheep, 3,000 3, camels, 5, 5. Honey's yoke of oxen. Five hundred she asses. And a very great household. 
so that this man would, was the greatest of all. All. How much? All. He was the greatest, no? At Ardim. All of Ardim creatures. He was the greatest, no? Of the East. I didn't say yeast. We just scratching the surface now. <laughs> I didn't say yeast. I said increase. He had. He was the greatest of all the men of the east. Now, let's stay here. He's the greatest man of the East. That means on the East side, the grace that he has is higher than everybody. Even people that are, are walking with God somehow, they're, they're, they're walking with him somehow. The grace on Job is higher than them. Now, watch this here. I'm showing you the different seasons of grace. The grace was operated in verse 1. He's a perfect and upright man. That means that he agreed with the Lord. The Lord could train him and make him who he want to be. The image and likeness of God can come out of Job. But now in verse 3, we're hearing how grace, it, it slipped and slide and took it to the house. And now we're looking at how grace now is operating in the finances, the provisions, what he possesses. Now look what it says. He had 500 she asses and a very great household. Do you know what a great, a very great household? Do you know what the translation of this means? He was very wealthy. He was very prosperous. You see how grace, how it graduates into different departments of your life? See, God wants to deal with the grace um, infusing you with his personality, but then it goes into your finances. Then it goes into your provisions. Then it goes into your abundance. Then it goes into you enlarging your territory. You having a big place to live. You having nice clothes. You having nice shoes. Hallelujah. See, the powerful thing about this is that you don't even have to look at Job. You can look at me. If we wave all these scriptures and we don't read another scripture, you can look at me and understand the reality of this grace and the graduations of grace. Hallelujah. How grace graduates into your materials what you possess.